Stanford University. So Bill has been CEO of multiple companies. Most recently, he was CEO of Veritas Technologies when the Carlyle Group bought it out from Symantec in, I believe it was 2015, 2016. He also founded BA Systems in 1995. He's the B of BA, and when he was chairman and CEO of the company in 2001, the company actually became the fastest software company to reach a billion dollars in annual revenue. He was also the CEO and founder of Cassette Corporation, and he's been an executive of a number of various companies in Silicon Valley. That includes, for instance, various management positions at Sun Microsystems. He was also at Visicorp, where he oversaw the publishing of the very first spreadsheet, Visical. And he also has a rich set of experiences in investing. He's been a partner at the venture firm El Sol partners. He's been an operating executive at the Carlyle Group. He started his career in the U.S. Air Force. He's also been on the board of various public companies and nonprofits, including Seagate Technologies. And he also has a rich background in public service, which includes starting the Coleman Institute for Cognitive Disabilities at CU Boulder. Bill, is that a good summary? Or I think I probably still missed a few things, though. <laughs> Sounds good. So for today's class session, um, I know you've looked a lot at 5G, so that's going to be the focus of today's class. Could you maybe kick us off by briefly describing how 5G is new and different from 4G and our current situation thus far? So let me start out by uh, thanking everyone. So 5G is probably the least misunderstood and at the moment uh, at the highest point of the Gardner Hype curve, which happens periodically. I mean, just to give you an example of the internet hype curve, it obviously blew up in the, at the bust in 2000, 2001, when the hype was through the moon on the internet, it was gonna go crazy, but it was a bust. And But what happened during that point was LTE was beginning to roll out and for the first time, you had very high band mobile and Wi-Fi was beginning to roll out. So you had very high band homeware. All of a sudden the network became massively used over the next years or so, but that didn't cause the value to be created. The value is only created by the applications or the new platform that's built on top of that, that makes things better, faster and cheaper than they were before. In this case, it had to do with the fact that we had end-to-end -end opening with very high-speed bandwidth. For the first time, everybody's using a network, and a whole new set of new things were created, but it took most of the decade. It wasn't until really about 07 when two things came together that caused social networking and Wi-Fi apps. Those actually built the whole next generation, and that's what brought the value and brought things like Airbnb and, and other businesses as well. So we've seen this picture before. It took LTE a decade to roll out because it doesn't happen all at once. It starts with a very simple set of specifications. So what is 5G? 5G is number one, it's a logical extension of 4G from a network point of view. In other words, 5G can, software can run on 4G networks. It won't get all the capabilities that it would get if it ran on a 5G network, but it will get some capability. And that's why you're starting to see an early rollout now where you might see 5G E or something sitting in there on your phone. It's not really the full 5G, but what it does is it gives you a better management of all of the network bandwidth that's being used, which can increase your performance by 50 to 100 percent. I'm sorry. 20 to 50% at theoretical max. So that's not the advantage that you want altogether, but it is a start. Now, the other part, there, there's two parts of 5G, as there is of, of all of these Gs. There's the network itself, and then there's the communications and what it's doing. In the 4G, the network, the switches had software on them that provided for some amount of security, authentication, and provided for routing of messages, nothing else. But that actually put some layer of security in it. The other part is the software, is the application itself. In this case, the revolutionary part of 5G is the software. So what we've got now, instead of having just switching software running on the switches, we basically have the switches running 
bandwidth consolidation and authentication, but all the software is now consolidated into a virtual stack. It's literally the same IP stack that we use for the internet. So in some ways you can think about 5G software as nothing more than an addition to the internet itself, except it's totally new. Now it's been developed by a group called 3GPP, which is the third generation partnership for 5G, which includes the seven key telecommunications organizations. And it's developed in stages. So you have the, the network part, which is called the RAM, the radio area network. By the way, we have 5G people have invented more acronyms than I could possibly throw a stick at. You can you got to go through pages of brand new acronyms. I don't know what drove them crazy, but the RAN is an easy one. That's the radio area network. And now there's the virtualized software, which is an IP stack, which means it now is end to end. And it means it can monitor and control anything that's going on anywhere in the entire network from end to end. It also means you can add applications to it, just like you can the internet. And not just applications at the highest level, but because it's an IP stack, you can have applications that manage different aspects of the network all the way up, including services on top of the stack itself. So it becomes a lot more complex. Now, what this really means though is you, what we've done is one, consolidated the management of the communications so that can manage number one, how it's actually being administered. So on, in five versus four, a little more technical than you need. In five, it's managed from one in one specific process, which consolidates the management and takes away a lot of overhead. But what it doesn't do is give you that massive new capability that everybody's talking about 100x over the current bandwidth. And the reason way it does that is with the new switches. This is the 5G switches. They are upwardly compatible for 4G but they are much more complex in that they provide the ability to put together large groups of bandwidth as if it's one piece and get and at a much higher efficiency. So all together, you can get 10 to 100 times throughput when you're using that. And it also uses a lot broader spectrum. Uh, we can primarily use today a mid-band frequency and a low-band frequency, which are one to three gigahertz, and then three to five, gig, three to six gigahertz. And the higher you go, now with this one, we can go to 20 to 30, the higher gigahertz. But the higher you go, you have differences in transmission. So the higher the transmission, the higher bandwidth. You can get huge bandwidth in the megawatts up in the 30 gigahertz. But the interference, it can be interfered with by anything almost, by plants, by your body, by walls. So you end up having to have a lot more antenna and therefore the costs go up a lot. I'll come back to the issues with that later. So most countries are trying to standardize mostly on the mid band, which gives you the best trade off between speed and antenna placement. These antennas are not huge. They're much smaller than the current ones. They're about the size of a bread box, but they add something else. They add, they add a real edge now. So what happens is, the antennas in a local area feed into an edge. And an edge is something that's connected to the network itself via some sort of a fiber optic and all. And the edges are important because you can control what edges you use. So just to summarize, this is gonna come in stages. We're only at the first stage, and we'll talk about that in the next question. It will roll out over the next five to 10 years to get fully complete as new applications are built out. And it's really mostly uh, almost all about software. Is that a little bit of a feel? Yeah, no, that's that's a great overview um, from a from a technology perspective. So I think especially at the end of the day, from a consumer usage standpoint, what are the real benefits of 5G? How is this gonna change our day-to-day -day lives in the future? Okay, so. It's kind of interesting. In the beginning, there's going to be some big disappointment with 5G because people are going to go out and buy new phones with these new radios in them. They're going to pay them a lot of money and they're going to get, they're not going to notice anything. I mean, you know, 
If you're downloading a really long movie, you'll notice that came in seconds rather than a minute. Okay, that's one thing. But almost everything you do doesn't take seconds, it takes milliseconds. So you won't even notice your things being any different other than when you're downloading big streaming bandwidth. But with the new antennas, of course, it can be massive. Now here's the real benefit. This is a service-oriented architecture. For any of you that know what that is, that means instead of being programmed to do one thing, it can be programmed to do services, individual services that have different requirements, different needs, and different functions so that have the functions to be programmed into it. What I call the superpower of 5G is called network slicing. Now, network slicing allows a slice to be created that allocates what specific towers it uses, what specific endpoints it uses, how it steers those, and what edge devices it uses. And then on top of that, it'll, it allows you, you to define for your specific application, net slice, then these all can run in parallel, for your specific next slice, what is the function you're trying to automate? whether it's driverless cars, ER, AR, telemedicine, mobile computing, IoT, they all will have different requirements as opposed, and the requirements now are functions. So what are the function I need to do for these? And requirements. Requirements are important because you can dictate which of these are important. And they are the obvious ones, throughput, latency, reliability, mobility, availability, energy efficiency and device density. And the reason you do that is, let's take driverless cars. You don't want it to be transmitting back across the network across the cable somewhere. Because by the time it does that and comes back, the little lady may have been run over by the car that was there. So you want latency to be as close to zero as it possibly can. So the thing about a network slice is to find something that you can control that can do something based on its needs. Telemedicine is another thing that's going to have a latency, but you've got to minimize that latency so it has to have priority on that. And it has to have ultra reliability. In the middle of a slice in an operation, you do not want that thing down. So network slicing is truly important. And that's why it's going to take the next decade to build out those things, just like it did the last decade for all of social networking and all that things that we're dealing with today from, from before. So it's really powerful, really powerful. And it also allows you to prioritize things like security and that I'll come back to in a minute because that's the downside, part of one of the downsides. Yeah. So, Could you maybe talk a little bit about some of the risks and downsides of 5G? Yeah. And so don't get scared by all of these bits because they're all moving forward and they have, we have a long time to solve some of them. But first is the net, is security, cybersecurity itself. Because this is a software network end-to-end, -end, it's subject to all the same vulnerabilities that the internet is, but it doesn't have the software built into it. And the internet never did either. The internet had to involve the entire cybersecurity industry over decades to be able to provide some level of security, which is not perfect. In this case, what's happened is the, the 3GPP organization had a working group called, I think it was working group three, that was responsible for security. And what they did is they added a bunch of security capabilities to the network that make it securable, but they don't actually secure it. They make it so you can authenticate and maintain privacy, but it doesn't mean that can't be broken into. So the key areas there are, number one is the devices getting into the, into the network itself. If it's just 5G network end-to-end, -end, that's pretty secure, but not totally. But if it's, 5G, if it's coming from any other G, and that, that happens all the time, 2G, 3G, or 4G, it's a vulnerability because they don't have the software capability to totally protect. And that's where you can end up with a billion devices. It doesn't take more than a few million to be hacked to uh, cause a denial of service attack that's unbelievable. 
The second is the only way to defend these kind of things from end to end, as we're finding out now on the internet and it's becoming a big move in cybersecurity, is called the zero trust system, where you can guarantee end to end that you can trust every component in it. This, this will take an end to end zero trust certification program where every item can be certified. We do have certs right now. What the reason? When I'm talking to you, I've got cert, you've got a cert on every one of your phones, on every one of your PCs. We need a we need a similar thing, with a zero trust version for this. And there are companies working working on it. Now the other really big one is the third big one is network slicing itself. They need to be compartmentalized, and that's how the slices are established. So we need to compartmentalize. We need to be able to compartmentalize them, not just from the system but from each other. And some net slices do talk to each other because they can infect one another as well. That's sort of the number one risk. The number two risk is the hardware itself. Now you hear a lot about China and all that, and we'll talk about all that, but the hardware itself is actually doing nothing but transmitting messaging. But that means that it's seeing every message. So if the hardware can be compromised by the supply chain or something put into some chips or something that is actually making that apparent to the bad guys, they can figure out how to attack the network. So those are the areas of cybersecurity that are being worked uh, on the network and the hardware and the software side. Now, there is one other vulnerability going on, and that is we have a massive fake news program that's been going on for over 10 years out of Russia against the U.S. and other countries, but particularly the U.S., to try to convince everyone that 5G is really bad, that it's good, bad for your health, that literally they say it's going to kill you. This is the Russian news network, which you can get on almost any TV in any hotel. And it's, it's the whole way of doing it. They do that, they expand it to another net, network they control. Then they have it retweeted a thousand times, then secondary news channels take it over, and then it goes big time. But the fact is that the health, there was 20 years of investigations on RF health concerns and uh, was all disproven. You, you will get more RF by holding your cell phone to your ear in five minutes than you will in a year sitting but with one of those towers out in the street. And you'll get more on an ongoing basis from your Wi-Fi in your house. So it's just one more factor that is laying on top of it. Yeah. Maybe we could talk a little bit about, uh, you alluded to China briefly. Um, so just in terms of overall from governments all around the world, it seems like so many countries and governments are racing to be the gold standard, the leader in 5G, China, South Korea, the U.S. being some governments. Um, why is becoming a leader in 5G such an important initiative for governments? Uh, it's not. It's politics. Newsflash. The U.S. has never been a leader in any G, never. We've always been a follower. We've always been a leader in what produced, though, We're, because the, the advantage to, the, to each G wasn't just the speed. It was that it allowed a new incremental kinds of things like social networking to be implemented, and that takes time. Well, we have always been the leaders through our innovation and our open society in creating those new capabilities. So we will see kinds of applications that we can't even think about today. We don't have a clue about today that are gonna merge out of this, that are gonna offer value that will take us to a whole nother level. This, the amount of value that, the, that we're gonna get from this service-oriented architecture that through network slicing is gonna dwarf everything else combined in the past. It also allows you to prioritize things like first responders. Today, if, uh, on our system, if we have a big earthquake or something, no first responder can get on the network. With 5G, first responders get priority, so they can get on the network. So there's all sorts of advantages, but there are some risks. So just on the startup front um, and innovation that's happening there, a lot of startups are looking to ride the wave of 5G. You're probably constantly pitched a lot of these companies. Is it too early to invest in a startup that needs a 5G network? 
to do what it wants to do? Or should we be investing in 5G related startups right now? By and large, I'd say no, not yet. I, I'll come back to the by and large part. VC investment has to do with when there's a dislocation or transformation going on that's changing the economics of the business so that what you do with a startup capitalizes on the new economics and disintermediates the incumbents. So you know, today, most of what's going on with 5G is not at that level. So just investing in 5G as a startup is not a place where you're gonna find a, a huge amount of investment going on for the next, for a short period of time. But over the next several years, it will. So one thing you have to understand is where we are in 5G. We are in release 15 from the 3PGG. So release 15 basically brings in network slicing and, and adds more capability, but it really adds the network slicing capability. Now, what is it that's going on right now that money could be made at? And there's only two things I can think of. Uh, number one is the cybersecurity itself, and I do know a couple of companies that are investing in that. It's going to have to end up being a, an open source consortium kind of a solution, but that's number one. Uh, so they go on to number two. It has to do with IoT. It's happening right now that, that you can get ahead of, and it's got to be a real problem that people are making themselves and putting money into. Because if they're not putting money into it and changing what they're doing, you're not going to have anybody to sell to. That being said, over the next few years, we're going to start seeing a massive industry of startups as new kinds of applications begin to become obvious and, and invested. That's when this thing will really take off. But also the reason I say China is not a problem is this isn't a political issue. This is a cybersecurity issue. And the government's trying to translate politics into it. We can protect from the RAN, we're in good shape and, and the politics won't really matter there. But those are two different issues. Mm -hmm. So just within the US, um, we've seen wireless carriers like Verizon, T-Mobile, rolling out what they're calling 5GE, but as you pointed out, it's really not truly 5G. When do you think we'll actually see every consumer in the US have access to 5G? Oh, five years from now. Uh, well, the first thing is, it, it's gonna take a long time to roll out these networks, but they'll roll out a city at a time, a location at a time, uh, ultimately, the networks are a lot more expensive. So in the U.S., if we aren't op don't open up more mid-band spectrum, which we offer, right now, a lot of it's controlled by the Navy, and it's an analog, and we're, we're setting up standards that it can be a dialogue. So I, I, I was finishing on China. I think that's about all I can really say. On, uh, I didn't hit on Verizon and, and the, the other network. They're going to roll it out a bit at a time. And you know, and the, and people are going. People won't be generally buying all the radios until they're almost free. And in the beginning, they're going to be charging extra for it. I think after competition sets in, it'll just be you know part of what you get. So it's not until we have a critical mass of people owning the phones and a critical mass of bandwidth out there that we're going to see uh, uh, the major adoption, and we're going to see moving on beyond this early stage. So it'll happen over time. It'll happen sporadically. You'll see it in the bigger cities first. And then, you know, then network slicing becomes more and more important. So think about the driverless cars. The, like I said, these things have to be in a limited area. And then they don't want to go over the network. So they got it. So they literally have to define a network slice that is the traffic congestion area. So it could be the core of downtown of San Francisco. That's one slice. It's just that one geographic area that has a slice that's doing nothing but ensuring that we have very low latency and very high availability and reliability specifically for driverless cars. But you can think about it with medicine, you know, AR, VR. I personally think that VR is going to be more like Zoom on steroids and it's going to make these kind of meetings even more, more remote work happen. I think 
AR is going to be more important because I think that's how you're going to really augment the reality of things and, and add lots of capability to yourself and your, on a day-to-day -day go on basis, but they both need connectivity. I'd love to talk a little bit about the cost and complexity for rolling out 5G at an infrastructure level. And we talked about Verizon and T-Mobile and the U.S. having more of a private sector approach to rolling out 5G versus in other areas such as South Korea or China. It's more of a government, uh, a lot of government fundings being put into that. Could you talk a little bit more about what is the cost and these roadblocks um, more from an infrastructure standpoint and where the U.S. stands, um, especially with that private sector approach? Um, and from a T-Mobile Verizon perspective, are they financially equipped to actually get the job done? Uh, the answer to those two are yes. The answer for, uh, well, I guess T-Mobile and Sprint are going to, I will say yes, it's going to take a while. But let me tell you the differences in cost. When AT&T rolled out their LTE network, there was a total of 85,000 nodes in the US. But if they have to roll out the current, the network currently using the very high bandwidth and we don't get more mid bandwidth, they'll have to use 1.2 million, not 85,000. So that puts the cost in the range of 20 billion or more dollars in capital equipment. So, and that only takes you to 90% coverage, which is the benchmark. It means that some rural areas are gonna to have to get it otherwise, and then the government will have to come in with some form of assistance. So now the difference in rollout, remember I said we're always, we're always one of the last ones to roll out our network, but the difference in rollout is gonna be dramatic. China is going to be the first by far in multiple reasons. They, they have theoretically, subsidized to the point of a hundred billion dollars between loans and and credits uh huawei to and a little bit zte to build their RAN networks but particularly huawei they also have mandated that all three of the mobile providers in china use the same network so they only have to build one and they're going to build it in a lot fewer stations than we are because they have taken over the mid band. So they'll have the best band bandwidth and they'll, and they're subsidizing the build out. So it's going to happen the quickest. So they have the network, but what does it mean to have the network? Not much, unless you have something that's going to really drive that network. And that's what the whole build out's about. Now, other countries like South Korea, where they're mandating their build out, you can close that one will have it built out a lot faster as well. Now this part of the whole issue with this is the manufacturing of the, of the brand itself, the device. There's obviously a concern in people's mind that China will backdoor things. So there are only four competitors building these devices. By far the most advanced and the most subsidized so they can sell it the most cheaply is Huawei. But there's also Ericsson, Nokia, and Samsung, they're all building it. We don't have any technology. We had Lucent, which came from AT&T, and we had Motorola. Both of them ended up being sold and then sold again to Nokia. So Nokia owns all that technology. It's, and it's more single focused than Ericsson. Ericsson's a full service. And then uh, Samsung is, is basically hanging there, number three, but moving fast because they're being used in South Korea build out. So any country can roll it out as fast as they want and how many dollars they want to spend. Uh, we're not helping ourselves roll it out any faster than the three big telcos can afford to roll it out. So it'll take several years. In the meantime, they've got a, the headsets have to come down so the cost of the radios are no, no more expensive. And in these phones, you have to have actually three radios because you have to have all three frequency bands, the low, the medium, and the megawatt. So a question from uh, the audience is, as 5G starts overlapping with more traditional broadband internet carriers, how will that change the way telecommunications interact? For example, will we start to see more competition between Verizon and Comcast? Do you think it will result in any buyouts or mergers? Well, the first thing is that's a $64,000 question really to, to see how it's going to affect the rollouts and competition 
I definitely think that how the border is going to dissolve or not between traditional internet and 5G is hard to see. But on the other hand, as they're all one basic software architecture with some different implementations because of network slicing, network slicing is there is software under our in architecture. That is what composes most complex applications today. But this is network slicing is something all of its own. And it just carries it to a whole nother degree. So I think there will be a lot of overlap and maybe mergers and acquisitions with in the cybersecurity side and the management side, et cetera. But unless something happens that migrates network slicing kind of capabilities back over into the internet, I still think the 5G is gonna have massive, massive implications. By the way, one of the first things 5G is, first thing it's gonna replace is of course, just a little uh, more bandwidth. But the second is, it's gonna mean the wireless carriers are gonna compete with the cable carriers to basically replace it and become all one thing. It's all bandwidth, and if it's all 5G, who knows? Mm -hmm. So I can say that's the $64,000 question. Mm -hmm. Just a broader question about telecommunications also from the audience is, will we see um, these expansions in telecommunications reach rural areas, and will rural areas ever even see the quality of connection we see now, not to mention 5G? I think we will. I think they'll be late. I think it'll be uh, just like the, the telephone system where the government had to make a right to use and, and require some amount of service to be provided at, at minuscule rates to rural areas. I think that'll happen. Rural areas now, some of them are adopting Huawei in order to get a bandwidth. So that's why the government's trying to fight this so fast because once you have that in your network, it's interconnecting with everything else, and therefore there's the vulnerability that I talked about earlier. Not, not a good thing. So another uh, more kind of competition pricing related question is, are we going to see providers more likely to sell higher speeds and response to highest bidders to the detriment of the general public? Overall, how will 5G influence the issues with quality of service? Well, that's another avenue. So far, when this administration came on board, they took down all of the previous administration, the Tom Wheeler uh, cybersecurity work that was being done. And they said that's basically up to, uh, up to industry. So we're left with what industry can do or will do. The reason I went back to talk about what the FCC did is they made it possible at that point, they changed the open network such that the carrier providers can charge differential fees based on things like quality of service. They've not shown any inclination to do that yet, but it's a wild card in which some of them don't try to charge by quality of service, which may not be a bad thing at a certain level because you got to pay for that. Somebody's paying for that quality of service. And if you did that, you could you could provide service and it might make it easier to provide service at rural areas at a lower cost but it's that's a wild card too that's another good question mm -hmm. so just with regards to standardization um and should we be focusing on a global standard and make it more user-centric do you ever see that possibly happening or well there is a movement it's called oran open radio area network and ORAN software. So there's actually these movements going on where there's consortium trying to build an open source version of this software, one that is can be certified and managed. That we once it's certified, we can guarantee that it's clear end to end, and that would handle the software. It can also be done for the network. And if we got all of the Nokia, Ericsson, Samsung to agree on a o ORAN open radio area network standard that would make the radio area network certifiable, then we could have that done end to end. That is a movement that is gaining a lot of traction. It would, it would have really help solve all these problems. 
but it's still not here. So I want to go back um, on the application front um, in terms of one of the benefits of 5G being lower latency rates um, and how that might affect, for instance, VR and broadly, uh, more broadly, just change content consumption by the average consumer. Do you have any views on that or thoughts on how we might be seeing changes in content consumption as a result of 5G? Well, I think, I think we're going to see content consumption go dramatically up. But the reason is not because it's more bandwidth. It's because the new applications will demand a lot more. I also see, we'll see, I believe we'll see a lot of application of AI which means a lot more data will be being consumed all the time for everything you're doing as the AI is trying, is trying to pull together all the appropriate data sources in real time to further the application itself. So yeah, I think it's gonna happen in two dimensions, but we're gonna see a lot more bandwidth used, used, but we'll have a lot more bandwidth, so that's what it's for. Mm -hmm. A follow-up to that, also a question from the audience is, will there be a cheap enough implementation to put 5G into IoT-related applications like Nest, home appliances, cars? Um, so I think it's a question of cost as it affects really the widespread use and application of 5G. Well, the answer is there has to be, and that's an area that may be a worth starting a venture work on, but there, there has to be a cheap enough version. And an and ORAN capability could solve that problem for sure, you know, because then it would be free. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to uh, wrap up with one final question in terms of just based on what you talked about right now, as well as what's being discussed within the broader industry, another audience related question, are there aspects of 5G that aren't mentioned or thought about enough right now? Are there aspects that are overhyped? Where should we be devoting our time and energy on? Well, I think I've sort of gone over that. Everything about 5G's eminence, preeminence rapidly is overhyped. And we'll have a little bit of, as I said, a little bit of a disappointment as people get these expensive 5G phones and find out they're not experiencing anything different. Or when they are, they're not very often experiencing anything different. But you know, I think is there, is there anything unique and different about? Well, I think there's lots different we don't even know about. If you hit on several of those questions, questions. Otherwise, you know, this is it's the dawn of a totally new age, and I can't tell you what it's going to be like in ten years. Yeah. But but I'll tell you, this is, this will bring on the new age of, of AI as a real tool that every human being will be interacting with, even without knowing it. Mm -hmm. Any final remarks you'd like to share that we might not have covered related to 5G, related to the future 10, 15 years from now with 5G entering our lives? No, it's just a sea change. You know, there, we've got some tactical issues to take care of in cybersecurity, and that, that we've got some evolution version 16 of the 3gp spec is due out next early next year and that actually includes what's really needed for all this bandwidth consolidation so until that starts rolling out over the next two years you won't be able to see a lot of that capability break through to get you your 10 and 100x of potential performance improvements and then that will what be what facilitates people coming up with these rocket science new ideas of doing things where a little bit of AI and a little bit of super bandwidth can solve problems that we don't even know are problems today.